Thank you very much, Lisa. Welcome. Um, I, no, I think I'm going to let you introduce yourself if you'll do a much better job of it than me. So thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for being ca for coming. I can see there's a lot of it in and out of the, of the room, the same people come in and going, so I don't know whether people are getting kicked off. But it is an awkward time in the afternoon to be um, sitting in with your family, so thank you. Uh, my name is Lisa Barrett and I'm a birth worker in South Australia. I have previously been a midwife. Um, and I want to talk to you today about the sociology of belief. So this is not a talk about women. So before I get on with it, I really want everyone to understand that the most devastating thing that can happen to a woman is that her baby dies. It affects her for her whole life. It affects her partner, the siblings, the grandparents, the friends, and the community at large. And we often, when we're talking around issues, forget that it really is a big deal to have your baby die. We often go to call it an adverse event. So if I call it an adverse event, it's not because I'm trying to diminish what happens. It's just the way we talk about it. And I think often it makes us feel less involved in what's going on. Um, I also want to acknowledge that Agnes was kept for over 700 days without um, a court appearance. And she was shackled when she was at court. And whatever it is that happens is a, totally an abuse of human rights. And say that Agnes is not the only person who is in jail for attending this. All around the world there are people in jail or in court and we know nothing about them. So this is um, for them too. When I talk to women, especially um, around their home birthing, I tell them that it's not just about safety. This is the actual talk they get. It was told to me that I was rough, I was forthright, but there is no point pretending. If you are planning to birth at home, it's not just about safety, it's about responsibility. And if you are not happy to take on responsibility for yourself and your child, home birth is not for you. If your baby dies at the hospital, they will make a big deal of telling you that it's not your fault and an even bigger deal of telling you it's not their fault because crap happens and you get the support that they can offer you. If your baby dies at home, no matter what the reason, they will blame you, they will say you made bad choices and they will blame your care provider and say that they were negligent. That is a fact. And as a birthing woman, if you can't accept that, you shouldn't be at home no matter what, and I think it applies to midwives and birth advocates and birth workers too. You really have to know that that is the bottom line. Um, and I also want to say that when it comes to the section rate, I don't really think that money is a driver, personally, because there's not enough of us to create a problem. I actually think that what I just said is the main driver. I feel that CTGs and inductions and augmentations and instrumental births are a symptom of the real problem, which is it is very difficult to accept responsibility. But if you do any or all of those things, then they will say you did everything you could. And nobody wants to be in a position where they can be accused of not doing everything. And I think until we all look at that absolute issue, then we can't ever change the cesarean section rate, no matter what no matter what we say about all the interventions that happen. Um, I want to tell you a bit about sociology and about beliefs. So when we go, so when we come into the main part of the talk, you know exactly where I'm coming from. Um, Sociology 
is a scientific study of human society, its origins, development, the institutions, and how it applies to social policy. Beliefs are really shared ideas that people have collectively, and they mainly gain from social experience, which comes in lots of different forms, and for us it's mainly now, as we all know, on the internet. Um, and our values are abstracts in society that define the idea of principles, um, of what is desirable and what is socially correct. And really, that's how we form all the opinions that we have. Um, there's a really good book that was written in 1928, and it's called Propaganda. It's by um, Edward Bernays. Sorry, I'm reading this because I did I thought I remembered who it was from. And he was on the hypothesis that there are invisible people carrying the power that shapes our thoughts. And he looked at psychological manipulation and the examination of techniques in public communication. It's a really, really good book to have a look at. Yes, I'm really sorry, I don't do slides. I expect you to all listen really closely and chat um, and tell me what you think. Um, and why would you need slides when there's such a fabulous picture of me up there? I don't even look like that today. Trust me. <laughs> okay, so I thought that I would look at some fundamental beliefs that I had or I used to have and I think is true for most of us. Uh, as midwives, um, and that really drives what we would believe to be true about everything. The, or the author was um, Berner, Edward L. Bernays, and the book was written in 1928. You probably got to get onto Amazon to find it. You know, one of those old places. Okay, so we have a few fundamental beliefs. Um, and I thought of myself and where I was quite a few years ago now. And I trained as a midwife at the age of 21. And I totally believed in regulation. I thought being a registered midwife was pretty amazing. And I think regulation is one of midwifery's fundamental beliefs. If you were here at the very beginning, you would have heard the lady from ICM talking about regulation and standard practice. and. Um, we push for that because we believe it keeps the public safe, because it protects midwives, it ensures standards, and it makes everyone competent. Well, does it keep the public safe? Um, I don't think so. Does it protect midwives? Definitely not, because even if we're not on trial in a criminal court, there are tribunals, there are trials, there are um, uh coroner's courts that can be perceived as trials, uh, and there are civil courts. So it really doesn't protect the midwife. Does it ensure a standard? Um, that's always debatable because we all have given standards, I'm sure. Uh, and does it make us all competent? No, it definitely doesn't do that. Some people will get their qualification and never ever do anything else, never do any advanced learning, never go anywhere with it. Um, another one that I really thought, um, and I find it's ingrained so deeply in people they don't even know they think it, is that doctors know more about health than anybody else, and they're probably the most knowledgeable people. Even in my own family, um, my older children, once they tried to said, well, I'm going to the doctor, and when they've gone, they've come back and said, mm, he said what you said. But even, it, you know, it is generally, um, you're right, doctors don't know about health, they know about sickness. However, the perceived, we're looking at a society, perceived thought, which is the thought that it's hard to get out of. And that's not going away from the fact that if we really need antibiotics, they save our lives. If we really, um, uh, if we're in a car crash, they can save our lives. We're looking at a general community thought. Um, a dead baby means that someone's to blame. Now, I can't say that I always thought that, but, you know, there is a time where you think it couldn't happen to me because I'm safe, because I'm a hospital midwife, because 
Um, I've done everything right. Um, and that is definitely perpetuated in society, uh, especially throughout the home birthing community. Um, the next one is, if it's in the newspaper, there must be at least a grain of truth to this. And I am totally guilty of this until it happened to me. Uh, and I can tell you now that I don't believe that anymore. And any piece of news I look at, I just think, oh, yeah, but what's the real story? Um, and yeah, you're right. News, news people are mostly lies, but mostly. You can even put mostly in there. So even you would think there's a great and truth in more things. And the biggest one of all is the country we live in is free. And more spiritual countries, we tend to believe that. And I myself sort of believed it until I realized that anyone, they can take your DNA and you can't control that. And they can get your bank account details and your email and take your things and you can't control that either. And we think that only happens to criminals and we'd be glad if it happened to criminals. But it's not how it works. It affects everybody every day. Uh, so when I was looking at those things, and I think they are fundamental beliefs that give us what we believe, we come on to Agnes's case and how we believe it couldn't happen to us or it couldn't happen to you, it couldn't happen in our country because we're free, because we have midwifery, people recognize us. Um, there's no way that it's going to be the way it is over there. So what I wanted to do, and we could go to the horse's mouth and email Agnes and say, what's the real story here? Or we could sort of look at so many things. But I thought I wanted to see what most of our perceptions would be by using tools that we use to get our perceptions. And that's mainly the news. And it's, in this day and age, in first world countries, it's probably Google. So I dutifully Googled. Agnes, and I have to really commend Tony Harmon for the fantastic job she did of getting her stuff out there and making it um, making it really ingrained into us uh, throughout promoting her film and getting it out there that the newspapers picked up what seemed to be an AAP statement because I looked at many newspapers from the Lefty Guardian in the UK to the South Australian tabloids, and most of them said the same sort of thing. And one, that Agnes was arrested in jail for camping in home birth, and two, that, you know, home birth is illegal in Hungary, and that's a terrible thing. And I think that most of us think that it's a terrible, awful thing that she was arrested in jail for home birthing, for champion in home birth, and for maybe not American midwives, but for most of the Commonwealth midwives when midwifery is a regulated profession, we really think that that couldn't happen to us. And home birth is illegal in Hungary, which is horrific, and again, for those of us who have midwifery regulatory bodies, we really... Um, oh, yeah, it is frustrating, you're right. Um, so that we really believe that it, it, these things are not going to happen. So what I try to do then is look behind that because I first came to know about Agnes the same way probably all of you did by seeing the literature put out there and saying this, there was this film coming and we wanted to show it. So... I did do a bit of Googling myself before then, and you have to go back to your 40 pages to find out what was going on then, because there's such a good job now on all the stuff that has come up since. And when I watched the movie, of the things that we think that can't happen here, I spent quite a bit of time crying, because... Uh, when she was going through the reporters and through the court case, um, I felt that that did happen to me. It wasn't a criminal case, although many people did ask me if I'd been convicted. Um, it was actually a coroner's case. Uh, but they can run it however they want, except they can't convict you at the end. So I thought that 
it is so close to home that how could it be that she went to prison then for, you know, she was arrested for um, homeless people and legal in Hungary. So I had a good look at all of the things over the last couple of days because I've only been Googling this for a few days. And the truth is, homeless wasn't illegal in Hungary. It was unregulated, which is very different. So an un unregulated homeless means that basically the government ignore you a lot of the time. And what I read was about one in three births were followed up by the police. And sometimes they were ignored unless they went to the hospital. They were treated pretty shitty. But they, they were going on with it. And I don't know how that's any different this year. Even as a registered midwife in Australia, that's pretty much how it was. Um, there were good relationships and there were crap relationships and then sometimes you're treated brilliantly and the women are well respected, sometimes you're not, but the women are well respected and sometimes the women are treated shittily as well. Um, yeah, I think that in the main, our belief that things are illegal is not always, when un when it's unregulated, and then regulated doesn't mean illegal, we just think it does and that's what fuels then our belief that it couldn't happen to us because it's not illegal or it's regulated or whatever. So um, on the note of it being unregulated, I read some very interesting comments um, about what happened because Agnes was fighting for regulations. She wanted regulations because they felt that that would make midwifery better. And this is maybe how she put her head up. She was um, actually stopped from practicing for six months back in 2003 after an event that happened in 2000. But obviously at that point, nobody was paying any attention. And I know lots of um, midwives who have been suspended from practice for different things, for short lengths of time, long lengths of time. They've been on restricted practice. And no one ever really knows because unless we put it out there, it, no one knows. Um, and, sorry, I, she was also an obstetrician, but she was suspended from being an obstetrician and she went and retrained because obstetricians couldn't really go to the birth, although some do go to birth. Um, she's not the only doctor that goes to home birth in Hungary. And what, what happened with the push for regulation was that it was finally regulated and those midwives that were doing it couldn't really do it anymore. Um, I read um, I read something that said, well, an apprentice midwife said, well, I had to stop because I was afraid of exactly what was happening to me, uh, to Agnes and the members of her practice happening to me and that I would get thrown in jail. So once regulation came in, it was up to the government to regulate midwives, and from what I Googled, there's only one regulated midwife, and that was only last year. So, we're thinking, so I was thinking that it's illegal, it could never happen to us. We're already looking that, um, the, that the nuances of this is that actually it was going on before, and the minute that regulation came in, and the more that regulation happens, and the harder they get on regulation, actually the more difficult it is for women to uh, actually get the birth that they want. Um, so we also know that saying that birth is illegal is sometimes political strategizing. And I know for myself, so with Agnes getting more and more out there and pushing more for women to have a regulated midwife, and I'm sure she wasn't pushing for regulation to stop midwifery. She was thinking, like all of us think, regulation will make it better, safer, more standard, that she put her head quite far up over the precipice. And I don't know about any of you, but I was getting along quite nicely myself. And then uh, before 2009, when what happened to me was I was on some committees. I was on the Home Birth Committee for South Australia where they were making policy. I was on the policy committee for water births. I was on the South Australian 
neonatal outcome steering committee and slowly I realized that actually there's nobody really on the side of women and there's hardly anybody on the side of midwives to the point that the, the health department said to me in one meeting when I complained, um, excuse me, it's okay for you to talk, but you're here to support the women. Well, I don't know what the other midwives or the obstetricians or the consumer reps were there to support, but at that point I sort of realized that it wasn't really, really um, something that I wanted to be involved in. I was also Vice President of the College of Midwives in South Australia at the time and ended up having to resign because I had clients who didn't fit anybody's criteria, even though there wasn't any at the time, and uh, I was apparently told I was giving them a bad name, so rather than drop clients, I actually had to resign from there. Then in 2009, things were changing. And again, this comes into what's happening, what was happening with Agnes. We were pushing for um, Medicare and we were pushing for um, practicing rights at the hospital. And mainly the people who were pushing of it were home birth. Um, yes, we are still on the sociology of belief. Um, this is because I'm just trying to explain to you that we believe that it couldn't happen to us that actually it can happen to any of us. I use myself uh, because I know what's happening to myself, but I believe if you look at Becky Reed, a similar thing is um, is happening to her. Um, and I read on the Mandala Law that they were looking at um, that Agnes being imprisoned. Why did they do that? Because they can. And what motivates them? It's just the power, and power corrupts actions. And that really is the sociology of what we choose not to believe, which is why we think it couldn't happen to us. Um, we can talk about Agnes's case because she wasn't jailed for um, something in home birth. Um, and what I, when I was talking about myself, what I actually was going to say was, until I stood up and started blogging about what was happening around the changes, I don't think anybody really had noticed me. Um, it was only when we started blogging documents and we started giving um, information to the public that before you know it, the Parliament House is following me and the Department of Health is following me quite openly on my RSS feed. Um, and before that, I wasn't really noticed by anybody. Um, Agnes was arrested, and she was charged on. Uh, she was charged with killing as a result of carelessness during work. So what she really was charged with was over some death. Um, and we might think that wouldn't happen to us because we have a regulatory body. But anyone who's been to a tribunal would know that a tribunal is called a trial. And it, um, it might not mean that you go to prison, but at any point, the police can be investigating you. Anybody, any time, any midwife. So um, what we want to believe, the sociology of what we want to believe, is because everybody needs a hero. And quite rightly, Agnes is a hero. She is an absolute hero, and she de deserves every bit of accolade that she's ever had, and she has been treated abominably, and her human rights have been violated. But look around in your own country. Why is it easy to support Agnes for the Australian College of Midwives and the International Confederation of Midwives and the UK College of Midwives? Why is it easy to support Agnes? Because we think Hungary isn't a first world country, that Hungary's laws are not our laws but it is not easy to turn around and support a similar thing in your own country because it is too controversial or it is too close to home or you don't want to be tarred by the same brush. When Agnes went to court, um, her charges, um, when, she, when she finally went, she was held without 
beliefs and without going to court because they felt that she would just continue to do this. Um, and yes, I believe a witch hunt is an abuse of human rights. That doesn't mean that I don't think that things should be investigated or that we should never look at our practice or we should never look at improvements or we should change. It just means that what we believe will happen to us if we are safe or if we are good or if we follow the rules is not a real thing. Um, just by, um, before we get to the court case again, I was talking to an aviator because this applies to lots of, a really, uh, lots of different scenarios and it was a really well-known aviator in South Australia and we were talking, I was talking about this subject and he said, and he, was, he talked about crashes and he said, in flying there are two people. There are the people who have had a crash and there are the people who haven't. And the people who haven't might think it's because they are the best or they are safe or they've got great equipment or the best training, but actually they're just in the queue to become the people who have. And it's not until you have had one that you realize that it's not really because of any of those things. And I think that actually applies to midwifery. So when Agnes is in court, her court case was similar to many court cases that go along, some in a criminal court and, a, and for people in regulation, if we're just looking at a tribunal, which doesn't mean a custodial sentence, what happened to Agnes is awful, but it does mean that how they are um, taken, how, how, they, how it is taken on is similar. So when she was charged, um, she wasn't allowed to have any um, expert witnesses from a board because by this time everybody is involved and everybody wants to put in. There was only written submissions for an expert witness. And that you might think that wouldn't happen because there are lots of expert witnesses, especially in the UK and in Australia. And what happened again in in my in in our case is that there was an expert midwifery witness, and she was sidelined. And in the write up of the case, she was barely mentioned. All of the facts, all of the uh, recent stuff that she said about midwifery, didn't make the final cut. Um, and there were, so for Agnes's case, the experts were obstetric experts in her country, all of them totally against home birth, and some of them not even with an appropriate of gynae qualification. Um, and her case was done on um, protocols for a hospital. Well, I can tell you that's exactly what happened. We did have some obstetrician give written, uh, give written um, submissions, but they were never cited. Their expert obstetrician was against home birth quite openly, and they did also put an expert on the stand who wasn't an obstetrician or a gynecologist, but was part of the ANA who have an open anti-home birth policy. So it is not so different what happened there as to what happened here in Australia or to what happens in the UK. Um, when you're looking at why governments do this, and that comes back down to the propaganda of what we believe, often for the governments who don't want to be seen to shackle, in, to shackle a midwife and put her in prison for 700 days, will do things that will make society in general believe something that they want. And what I was saying about heroes is something that a journalist said to me, and she said, you are either a hero or a villain in a story, because that's what people want. And if you're not the hero, then you must be the villain, and you can't do anything about that. So I know in the media in Hungary that Agnes was the villain. She had started with some kind media, and at the end, the media was horrific. And what turned it around was the amazing Tolly Harman and, and her uh, and, and her 
fantastic film about what are the the real issues here. But again, it's really what makes us believe it. And I, for me, sometimes I think that some of that stuff makes us believe it couldn't happen to us because it doesn't actually go into detail on all the issues. So governments who can't stop midwifery because that would look terrible on their and we're free, put out there in the media what they want, make regulations as what they want, and dress it up so that it looks like they're pro midwifery. Um, I heard a talk earlier about um, Medicare midwives in Australia, and there were lots of pertinent questions being asked that really didn't get answered because what happens when you regulate more is that you get more rules, and more rules could protect some people but it doesn't protect a woman who wants to be back after two sections at home, and it won't protect her care provider. Um, I don't know if the media really... Um, oh, I see, the media does need more regulation. No, the, the media just need to understand that what they do, do is to report the facts, and that would be um, really the best thing for the media. Um, I think that we do all want experiences that it won't happen to us, and that's why we believe that regulation is a good thing. Um, but regulation doesn't protect that. In fact, sometimes it makes it happen also. Uh, and again, you can go and look at Becky Reed's case in the UK, which is the highest profile case in the UK that I could find at the moment. So what the government in Hungary did was they prosecuted Agnes um, over cases to make home birth look devastatingly dangerous. Um, I saw another little quote that said, um, a, a few babies died and they used that to um, create the issues. And that's what they did. In fact, they said a couple of pe pe cases where the baby died. And I saw a really good quote that I thought I'd add because it was from Sarah Stewart. And it says, clearly, this is being used to score particular uh, political points in Hungary. Uh, and of course he's right, because of course it was to score political points in Hungary. And the the midwife that I told you that said she was afraid that something like this would happen to her, so it made her stop. So prior to regulate prior, prior to regulation oh dear. Sorry, that's my phone. Um so prior to um, prior to regulation, uh, the midwives could do it, and then we'll look at. But after regulation, the government had to make it so that everybody was scared to do it, and make the the rules so tight that nobody could get the ability to do it. And that's exactly what is happening in Australia, and it's really what's happening in the UK, and that's right in Canada. We all think that, oh, we have midwives here, so it's fine. But we only have midwives here for, to do the things that either the government bodies or the regulatory bodies say that you can do. Um, so when we're looking at what we believe about Agnes, it's that we believe that she was just camping in home birth and in our country, nothing like that would happen. So what the truth is about Agnes is that she was birthing with lots of women. She put her head up there. She was outspoken. And when a baby dies, you either look at it as an adverse event or you put it in the media and you make sure that nobody else wants ever to do it. If they put media out there, about the hospital birth, then actually there would be no room in the press for anything else. So um, I think that they have to push what their agenda is. Um, do you know what, Emma? It can happen to a hospital midwife. In South Australia, there was a case where um, a, a couple sued the hospital, and the hospital counter sued the midwife. Um, so, yes, none of us are protected, and midwives are the bottom of the heap, and if they're looking for someone to blame, it's always going to be a midwife. Oh, I wanted to tell you something else about, um, uh, about Agnes's court case, about what they said 
were her problems. So after they made the charges, the main things were that in the shoulder dystocia, there was a shoulder dystocia case where the baby died, that they couldn't expect the baby over four kilos to give birth, and she should have known that. And in fact, that's pretty much exactly what they said in our shoulder dystocia case. And that she did an impossible maneuver and she broke the baby's neck. And the obstetric specialist said that the maneuver that we did was impossible for midwives to do and that when I needed help to get the baby out, it was simply because I was incompetent. So we, when we look at the, the nuts and bolts of what actually happened to Agnes, it does happen here. It happens all over the world. It happens on a daily basis. I must say that some of my um, own issues started um, when I was looking at Agnes's case, started because I was more than a little pissed off that the Australian College of Midwives and the Australian Private Midwives, both of which I belonged to when I was a midwife, um, supported Agnes um, so much and they got it out there and they showed the movie and but they couldn't support somebody in their own country. Um, I had already been told by the Private Midwives Association I should be a secret member because I was controversial, um, and that was back when I was a midwife. Um, I also know that the British College of Midwives sent um, Leslie Page, went personally to Budapest, and she put in a plea for clemency, um, and she is someone who has given evidence against midwives in a very similar situation. In fact, there's a soldier dystocia case in Canada. So well, why are we not looking at a thing where every body of midwives can support midwives um, all the way down, uh, down the line? I don't know why there is. I don't know what makes the difference. But um, I do know that when they had the um, rights to childbirth, the international conference, that there was lots of talk about what was going on. And in Australia, they thought they'd have a conference too. And I thought, well, great. That's a really great thing to do and a great way to get everything out there. But um, I was told I couldn't sit on the floor because I was too controversial. And so I bought a ticket and just went along. And I was not allowed to speak. I was not allowed to say anything. However, a professor did get up and use the coroner's notes to create a massive talk against me. I was in the audience. I wasn't allowed to say anything. I wasn't allowed to get up. I wasn't allowed to ask a question. Um, so where is it that we think that human rights start and end? And who is it who is able to be the people that we support and the people that we don't really support? I think that's a massive midwifery issue that um, Hannah Darling was talking about. That No, I wasn't allowed to ask the question. Um, uh, when she was saying that we should all stick together, she showed um, a, a great picture of a pile of different types of sticks all tied together. Um, and that's what it's like. We are all different. We don't all agree with what each other say. Uh, however, if we all stick together, then we are a formidable body. Um, yeah, I remember when I was nominated for the Private Midwives Association for every role and I wasn't allowed to take any of them. But all of that is personal to me and I understand that, but I'm not the only one. I'm not the only um, person in Australia that has gone to Helen back for supporting women, and I'm not the only person who has put her head up and spoken out and been vilified for that, and I'm not the only person who has been at a birth where a baby has passed away. But it's, and it's just if we all support each other, no matter what our title is, no matter where we are, because we're supporting women, then actually we will all get together and we will be successful. And I think that's where we can back around to the sociology of our beliefs. If we believe that it could happen to us, and we believe that we are all in it together, then actually we can affect social change in the way that 
the books tell us that it's an invisible table carrying the power that shapes what happens. But until we believe that it couldn't happen to us, because we live in a free country. It couldn't happen to us because we're safe, because we're regulated, because we're good practitioners. Um, then I don't think we're actually going to get anywhere in maternity services and things are never actually going to get better. Okay, so I stop the breath now. Yep, uh, taking a breath, that's marvellous. Um, 40 minutes, Lisa, without, without a breath at all, so I don't know. Your dentist says, my know you can do that. Um, we're going to be coming up to the um, end of this session. So has anyone got any questions, uh, any particular questions that you'd like to ask Lisa? Lisa does a brilliant job of answering questions as we go along. But has anyone there in the, in the last few minutes want to ask anything specific? Yeah, if you put your hand up, I will um, enable your mic for you. Here you are, go ahead. Well, while they're doing that, Shannon, I... Oh. Oh, yeah. Pardon? Denise, did you want to ask a question? Yes. Are you, okay. Lisa, and Maggie Lickie Thompson going to write your stories, please? <laughs> well, I won't be writing a story anytime soon because I'm still being investigated by the police, but you never know. Um, the yeah. obvious question here, yeah, Shannon says, how do we cross the lines? Um, it gets more and more difficult to cross the lines the more we agree with regulation, the more we bow to it, and the more we don't stick together, then we can't until we all agree to disagree but work in one community then it's almost impossible really. Um, I don't know that we can, because there's the people who are in and the people who are not in and that happens in a lot of different systems as women, it becomes very difficult to um, put aside our own fears um, and going back to that it could never happen to us and the way we view responsibility it it's almost it, it's almost an impossible feat really because midwifery is quite broken as well as obstetrics is quite broken I think that a, we have to uh, oh, sorry, sorry Emma we, oh Lisa, you've got a couple of hands up, a couple of people would like to ask questions. Do you like okay. to take a question? Yeah. All right, who has their hand up? I've lost them now. Whoever has had their hand up, can they put it up again? <laughs> probably taking it back down again. Sorry, Lisa, I've lost whoever it was, so go ahead. Okay. Um... Yes, I can I can talk about the times when we were raided by the police and our equipment fees. Um, I have also been detained and read my rights by the police. Um, what happens here in Australia with a home birth um, transfer, where the baby is compromised or, or not alive, is that the police are called and you are detained by the police and they search your home and they take your equipment and they take your telephone. They actually um, took a knitter needle that I had and asked me if I broke waters with it. So um, that is basically what happens here every time. Um, um, and this is not just for the midwife, this is for the woman as well. It happens to the woman, they go to the woman's house, even if the baby has just passed away. They take her equipment, they take her photos, they take um, her telephone. Um, and they investigate it in an, in a serious way. Yeah, um, there was a question earlier that I was going to answer, but I can't really remember what it is now because so many people are chatting. I'm sorry about that. Um, disability in the media is always um, a double-edged sword. Um, a positive view of midwifery is um, a good thing to let people know what midwives do and how they act. However, we midwives are constrained 
in what they do and how they act. So you can say one-to-one -one literacy is really important and we will do it with you what matter, no matter what. However, this is not actually true. Um, and they only hear about negative outcomes because that is actually printable news and it is actually what the government would want you to know about because they want you to think that home birth is so dangerous and certain care providers or all care providers who are midwives are really dangerous and that you do it at your own risk. And that's why they drag women through the news as well as their care providers. Tell them about my DNA. Um, I had to give up my DNA. Um, I didn't want to, but it, they read your rights, and if you don't voluntarily do it, they do it with reasonable force. And that can apply to anybody. Um, they can't stop and search you, but they can stop you on the premise of a random breath test and then try and search you. And that has also happened to me on numerous occasions. Um, but this, uh, and this is all happening in Australia today. Um, I think that it is different in different cases. I think it is particularly bad here, and it is particularly bad around me at the moment. And um, I agree, Rachel, that it does depend. But the police do get to investigate all of it, whether they are overt or covert. Um, I don't think you should doubt being a private midwife in Australia, although I think being a private midwife and being an independent midwife is different. If you're a midwife with um, Medicare, you are not going to be home birthing with anybody um, unless you're going to uh, sort of put that aside. Um, it's really quite a complex system that we have here now. Um, Lisa, I've got, Lisa, I'll tell you what, you've taken a breath and I'm going to jump in there. <laughs> Look, I could sit, we could sit around and talk about these issues um, for the rest of the conference, I'm, I know. Um, but um, I'm going to have to draw close to this session. And thank you very, very much for being very honest with us and sharing with us some of your experiences. Um, and uh, so, um, Lisa, I'm, I'm going to thank you for that. Is there anything that you just want sort to of finish up with? And, and um, give us a, I, I don't know about anyone else, but I'm feeling a bit, a bit depressed and a bit scared. Can you, can you sort of... Uh, Sum up things in a, in a um, sentence to make me feel a little happier about being a midwife. Um, well, I don't think you need to tell people because once you've been to an understood birth, there is nothing as amazing in the whole world and we fight every day so that every woman gets the right to have that exact birth. Um, and, and that's where there's so many people fighting for the cause because it's something that we all believe in and that is a really good thing. Lisa, thank you very much for those inspiring um, words. I was thinking what I just said then, um, you know, it's good to be inspired, but it's also good to be um, challenged and maybe to think and consider things. So thank you for that, Lisa. I'm sure you've done that for all of us. Really appreciate um, you stepping in, particularly at, um, right at the last minute for us. So I'm just going to turn the uh, record off now.